Hi, I'm Catherine. And I'm Gail. And welcome to Women Over 70 Aging Reimagined, our award-winning weekly podcast. Please visit us at womenover70.com. Consider membership in Aging Reimagined Circle. Become a sponsor and mark your calendar now to attend our first symposium in the Chicago area on October 19th, 2024. Please join us in continuing to inspire women to age with curiosity, courage, and creativity. Today, we're delighted to welcome Sheila Solomon. Sheila Solomon, age 71. She began her career in mass media arts 50 years ago upon graduating from a historically black college in Virginia. And a curiosity and service have guided her career choices in print journalism, from reporting to copy editing, to mentoring, recruiting, and training, and most recently to leading boards. Sheila was among the first African-American women to work in the newsrooms of regional and national newspapers, where she encountered gender and race issues and the quota system. She became a dedicated advocate for affirmative action, bringing people of color into the news business and reporting on race issues in professions outside of journalism. She spent 15 years with Tribune Company in Virginia and Chicago, and currently Sheila serves as Strategic Alliances Manager with Ribbit 360, which is a business-to-business -business podcast agency, and she volunteers her leadership wisdom as co-founder and vice chair of the board for journalism funding partners and as president of the City Bureau Board of Directors. And Sheila is a proud legacy member of the oldest African-American sorority in the United States. So welcome, Sheila, to Women Over 70. We're delighted to have you with us. Thank you. So you told me, when we, you and I talked before this, you told me that journalism for you is about telling stories about what's really going on. And now that you, I reported some of the facts of your professional career. So let's hear more about your story of what's been going, what was going on for you. And, uh, you know, we're very interested in, um, in what ways did you experience gender and race bias and the quota system during your early years in journalism? I can say from the very beginning. So the very beginning, meaning I'm still a student finishing up my undergraduate work, but at a point where editors and um, other professionals are beginning to come onto our campus to interview us. And in every case, it was made crystal clear, both through our professors as well as those coming from newsrooms across the country, that they were coming to our campus Hampton University, Hampton Institute at that point, because they were interested in hiring African-Americans to come into their newsroom. Mm -hmm. Always that was, that was out there. And so I can't say that I felt any different about that. I mean, that was all that I knew. I had gone to a high school that, um, well, where I was in a class, my graduating class was the first to uh, integrate that high school. And so I was kind of used to, you know, being in a situation where I might not be in the majority. I'd gotten used to it, had lots of support, and found it to be no different, in my case anyway, on my campus. And for that matter, even some of my professors were um, white. So there really wasn't much new. And of course, we were being trained to be able to handle ourselves in a situation where we were likely to be the only ones in the news for us we may go into. So from day one, you know, that was um, par for the course. And I have to say that basically I'd say at least through... Um, well, I don't know that there's any portion of my career where that wasn't some portion of knowing they're looking for a woman. Mm -hmm. They're looking for an African-American. 
they're looking for particular age. They're looking for a particular kind of culture. That's yeah. that's the way it was. Yeah, and and still is, still is, still is. And so that's one of the, I think one of the missions you have in the work that you're doing now is to continue to open space for for women and and uh, African Americans. And but you know, you told me a story about your name, Solomon, about being in, invited to interview because you have had the right credentials. And when you showed up, what happened? That's right. That was uh, the experience of, see, we had been, I was married at the time. We had been living in Japan. My um, then husband was being reassigned back to the States and we moved to North Carolina. And I think we knew at least six months in advance that was going to happen. So I started reaching out to newspapers, knowing I was coming back to the States and hoping to get a job. And uh, sent, uh, let's see, sent one letter. That, is it okay if I name the, the organization? Sure. Definitely not. It's okay with you. It was, uh, it was called uh, the Greensboro News and Record. And that's in uh, Greensboro, North Carolina. And so I sent my resume, I sent them newspaper clippings from my uh, internships from the first full-time job I had out of college at Newsday, which is in New York. And uh, what else? Oh, and I also had recent clips from work that I was doing in Japan. They sent me a letter fairly quickly letting me know they were really interested in talking with me and I just needed to let them know when I got back or got back to the States. That's what I did once we got settled in Greensboro. And I went into the uh, office that day, the office building, knowing that the first person who I would speak to would be the general manager. And as soon as I walked in his office, his face told me he was not expecting me. My last name is spelled with three O's, which I believe is a traditional spelling of Solomon by Jewish people. And that wasn't anything I paid attention to, by the way. I started being told that when I would tell this story. The uh, general manager and I had a, I would call it a reasonable conversation. All along, I could tell something was up. I, I almost half remember him saying he wasn't expecting me. But, I, you know, after all this time, I can't say whether I'm making that up or did he really say something like that to me? Because he also let me know that I would be interviewing with people upstairs. That's where the newsroom was. And that, um, you know, some of them might be surprised to talk with me. Went upstairs. I had nice interviews. Of course, my, my clips were good. Otherwise, they wouldn't have had me come in. Mm -hmm. And I spent a good portion of the day there. And then I went home and I found out, you know, from them later that they were not going to offer me the job. I got another job, and it so happened that the person who was my manager in this other job was married to the city editor at the Greensboro News and Record. I had interviewed with her husband, and her husband had gone home the evening of that interview with me, letting her know the ruckus that had occurred in the newsroom that I was unaware of. And he told her the story and, and said, you know, check her out and, you know, let let her know what happened if you think it makes sense. And so I've been there a little while. I remember having lunch with her one day and she asked me if I, if I remembered meeting a Bob Register. And I said, yes, I think I did. And she reminded me what his role was. And I said, oh, yes, I did meet him. She said, well, let me tell you what he told me. And so she went on to relay to me what I just said to you in regard to the surprises that everyone had and the fact, and this again was, I think it was the first time I had been in a situation where I was aware I might be affected by a quota, so to speak, mm -hmm. because they were not looking for any more African Americans in that newsroom right then. And so they did not offer me a job. That's yeah. quite a story. You um, you've navigated many roles, many responsibilities in in journalism, and you 
I think you held um, you were the high had the highest position that an African American woman held at one time, and I I don't remember now if that's correct or what that was. That is correct. In a couple of newsrooms that I was in, I was in an executive role, and yes, I wasn't the first, but at the point where I was in those newsrooms, I was the only. So do you want to give us some highlights about your accomplishments? You have so many. So what are you especially proud of? What what has been most meaningful for you? I'm especially proud, I believe, of one, still being someone people think can um, continue to help people in this medium we're in. So I'm very proud of that because it's not been intentional on my part. In fact, when I left Tribune, I really was serious and was telling people this, that maybe where I got myself in trouble, that I wanted to do something else. I had spent a good portion of my time, more than 35 years at that point, in journalism. And so I thought, it's time for me to do something else. Let me see what it's like in the real world. And that's what I was trying to do, making every effort I could. But I kept being pulled back. Um both into uh, newsroom opportunities, but also the opportunities to continue to mentor um, people who are in all facets of our business, whether it's radio or TV or digital or print. Uh, and then um, somehow found myself on a board. In fact, I think pu the public narrative board, um, then community news media, I believe is what it was called, was the first one, if I remember correctly. And it just kind of snowballed from there. So I think that's what I'm most proud of. I'm, I'm still still doing with so many people in the family that I'm a part of um, was doing. They were, a lot of my family members were educators, including my mother. And no matter where I went, and that includes living in Japan, I ran into people whose paths that crossed with some of my relatives as teachers as the principals or, or you know, mm -hmm. something that I wasn't expecting. And they, as soon as they found out where I came from and then my name, they asked, well, are you related to so-and-so? And that would lead to stories <laughs> of how they had learned so much or been impressed so much by. And um, I find myself, especially at this age, uh, hearing that and not feeling the way I did when I was younger and felt and thought, you know, I'm not trying to be like them. And here I am being like them. Being like them. <laughs> right. Sheila, <laughs> you, you, you um, if I understand it correctly, you've devoted your life to civic journalism? What well, I'd like to think that's the case, yes. What t Tell us what that means. Well, what that means is that I honestly entered journalism with the idea that I would be a reporter covering those local stories, those people uh, that you were not reading about, you weren't hearing about. And obviously, in my case, I was not um, meaning to not cover people who didn't look like me, but I absolutely was intending on covering people who did look like me, who I knew a lot of others did not know about and should know about. And I set out to do that in my first internship and continued to do that as long as I was a reporter. Um, and that fed and still feeds right into all of the other work I do. Nothing I've done um, has left anybody out. And even in my recruiting, I never told someone, I can't work with you because I'm looking for somebody who looks like me, or I'm looking for this, I'm looking for that. That, that is not me. And so I'm, I'm proud, too, that I have so many people um, who know this about me and come to me and send people to me. So um, for me, civics journalism is about helping your neighbor to understand about your neighbor. Who are the people next door, around the corner, um, the ones who you might bump into on a bus or on the street? Who are they? What do they do? How are they helping 
uh, your community to grow or maybe not to grow. And that's always been my intent and why the boards that I serve on now and growing community media, which you all may be familiar with, is one of those too. I just love the fact that it has such a supportive local subscribership, Mm -hmm. Uh, not something all of our newspapers uh, or newsrooms, period, can, can say. So when you were reporting on those stories, Sheila, where where was where were those stories placed in the newspaper? Where oh, would wow. we, where would we uh, find them? They, uh, gosh, they could have been anywhere. Sometimes they were on the front page. Oh. Um, sometimes they were inside. Sometimes they were in a particular section of the paper. So everywhere, everywhere. It, it really it really would depend, right? Yes. Is there are there a couple just a couple of stories that really stand out for you? I'm sure they're all meaningful, but yes, okay, there are two that stand out. But as soon as you said that, I thought there are two that I often use as examples when I'm talking to to students or um, less experienced journalists because they um, they reflect something that we as journalists have to always remember. So here's one. So I was on the editorial board. And my job was uh, editing the letters to the editor and managing our opinion page. So letters to the editors, we got hundreds a week. And I'm not exaggerating when I tell you that. And most people did not know or care, thankfully, you know, what my race was. And there was an incident at, uh, when the editor came back from a trip. And you got a phone call uh, from someone in the community who was really upset that I had not um, chosen to publish his letter. And he claimed that um, because I was Jewish, I was always leaving out you know, uh, reflections from Jewish citizens. So the editor had me come in his office one day for the conversation with this person. And... It was phone conversation, and the editor did not tell me ahead of time what uh, what was going on. So I'm listening to the call, <laughs> just as the editor is, and hearing him berate me based on uh, the the caller that is berate me based on his thinking that I've got to be a Jewish woman. And um, Rich Apple, who was the editor then, uh, pointed out that I was in the room with him. And that he was going to ask me to you know, identify myself a little bit, which I did. I have no idea if I ever heard from that person again. You know, I, I wasn't swayed by that. I, it wasn't meant for me to be swayed. As far as the editor was concerned, they trusted, you know, my choice of letters. Um, um, and then what's the other time was, um, well, again, it, it involves a letter to the editor. And for me, especially in Charlotte, where we did receive such a volume of letters, I mean, even compared to some larger newsrooms at that time, this was in the 80s and the 90s, uh, the letters that we received were uh, such that they often prompted um, others to respond and say, hey, can you help us do something? So, you know, now you might see in a newspaper article, um, a request that you help so and so if you can, and they have the information in there. Well, we weren't doing that then, but I published a letter from a woman who was in need, and I don't remember what it was that made me publish that letter. Maybe it was the season because we were between Thanksgiving and Christmas, if I remember correctly. And she had written a, a couple of letters, and I had published one of them that just spoke to what we knew was happening throughout the community. So she was representative of other people. Didn't know what her race was, didn't care. But others read the letter, and again, I think because of the season, said, Sheila, we want to help. Can you help us? Because there was nothing about the letter that allowed them to know Mm -hmm. where she was from. So I figured out how to reach out to her. I uh, got permission from my editors to um, go visit her. I did that. She was um, 
white woman living in uh, subsidized housing not far from where our newsroom was located. And she and I had a good chat, found out all the things that I thought I needed to know to let our readers know, yes, this woman deserves your help. And she got it. No, oh, that's wonderful. Wonderful. Um, so I know journal, your journalism is still is continues to be a key major part of your life. I also assume you have a life outside of journalism. So trying, <laughs> trying. <laughs> what uh, what what would you like to tell us about your how you live your life uh, outside? Well, uh, I. I live a very good life here in Chicago in spite of the weather. So I'm a part of a walking group that um, involves mostly women, but not entirely. Uh, some of them live in southeast um, Chicago, so in neighborhoods that I really knew nothing about. And I came upon them because of um, a story I saw in some publication about what the park system was trying to do in getting more people to get out community and discover the parks. I said, okay, I think I'd like to do that. And I love walking. That is how I get my exercise. So uh, these women, uh, we, we make up an age range from 25 to 83. The oldest person is 83 and all in between. Uh, Latina, Polish, African American. So that's one. You okay. mentioned my sorority at the top, and my sorority is Alpha Kappa Alpha Incorporated. Spend a lot of time with them, and we are civic minded. So we're out in the community doing, you know, all kinds of things. Uh, what else do I do? Oh, I love movies. I love going to the theater. I love music. Um, I do have a male friend, and so we. We love going out to eat dinner at different places across the city, although he's a quite heavy meat eater. So we <laughs> find ourselves checking out barbecue a lot. I don't I don't complain too much about that. I miss the barbecue from the South. <laughs> so we're always trying to get close to finding more of that. And I have grandchildren who live in D.C. who I keep up with. In Washington, D.C.? In Washington, D.C. Mm -hmm. that's, that's a wonderfully full life. I kind of envy it. <laughs> Well, envy me when I really can do more of all of this. <laughs> Gail? Well, I'm just wondering about, how, do you think about your own aging process at all? Yes and no. How how might you be asking me that? Well, you know, we like to kind of ask our, all of our guests. How, how do they think about their own aging? Are they planning for the future? Do they think about it at all? What? How do you live your life in in uh, thinking about your own aging? How does it affect you if it does? And if it doesn't, we want to hear about that too. No, I, I do think about it. And I thank God every day that I'm still here. One of the things that I did not mention and often just plain forget about is uh, the fact that I have a very rare illness that I was diagnosed with soon after moving to Char uh, to uh, Charlotte back in the 80s. I had sold my house in Virginia, moved my little toddler son. We didn't really have family or connections in Charlotte. And within maybe seven months or so, I was not feeling myself. I wasn't able to eat. There were all kinds of things going on. I was seeing doctors. They couldn't figure out what was going on. And I was really just getting worse. My parents, my mom had recently retired from teaching by then. My dad had already retired from his job. They came to Charlotte to, you know, be with me and try and figure out what was going on. Long story short, it did take some time. And I was so lucky that I was in number one, a newsroom where they were, for whatever reason, they had decided I was worth hanging on to. They didn't know what was going on with me either, but uh, they allowed me to have the time that I needed, and I had no idea how much time that was going to be. Uh, eventually, I had to go to Duke Hospital 
for uh, an analysis and uh, ended up having some surgery and could not be back in the office for about six months. And the newspaper set up a computer in my home so that I could actually continue working. And that was not something they did for other people. Yeah. Even when they ask after other people knew, well, they did it for Sheila. Hmm. I don't, I've never known exactly what made that happen. But back to the actual illness part, I, again, was lucky being diagnosed when I was because it was so rare at that time. There were only, I was told, maybe a thousand people in the world who had this disease. And they recently had come across the way they mean scientists and doctors to at least figure out how to manage it. It's incurable. Mm. But they found out how to manage it. And they were going to experiment with me. And um, others before me had not been, you know, so lucky. They either um, had been in a place where the disease had ravaged them in such a way that they could not go back to being in the roles they had been, or they had not been able to live long enough um, to go any farther. And so I don't forget that any day that I wake up, uh, even though I don't talk about it a lot, and there have been times when I've had to explain to someone because I was uh, using a cane at one point not long after I came here and they didn't understand what that was about and I explained very briefly that, oh we can't look at you and tell there's anything wrong with you and I said, well I can thank God for that the invisible illness yes yes invisible to mm-hmm. people to many to people other exactly people. Yeah. a little less so now because there are things that are happening to me um, that, well, I certainly know, and, and the doctors know when they look at me that maybe I wouldn't look this way if other things were different. But I don't even pay that any attention anymore. Good luck thank to you. you. Yeah, thank, thank you. Well, we've already had good luck so far. Would you just make 71? <laughs> yes. Yeah. So if there's gratitude, there's... Uh... You don't take much for granted, I, I assume. I try not to, and I do know that it has um, played into uh, conversations I've had with some people when uh, I've been uh, hiring them or interviewing them, because people, I find, people always told me things I wasn't expecting to hear, even when I was a reporter, even without me asking. And the same thing happens when I'm interviewing them for position. You know, something that I don't even need to know. So I'm definitely not going to be asking. You blurt it out. Mm -hmm. And oftentimes it's because, and they will say this, it's because where I've been, when I've talked to other people, they have let me know that this is just the kind of impediment that is likely to keep me from being in your workplace because we don't have people who are going to know how to engage with you. You know, it. Very, very sad, actually. Mm-hmm. You know, to hear, and it, hear is that. that the case? Is that really the case, or that's their perception? I'm, I'm, no, I'm afraid to say it. It can be the case in some places. Yes, yes, it was more than perception. Uh, but in telling me, it, it wasn't me then saying to them, "Well, I can tell you, you won't have to worry about that in that place." Mm-hmm. But if I tell them my own experience then they can presume that if they are to come, this is not going to be an issue mm-hmm. in the newsroom because I'm an example of it not being an issue. Yeah. yeah. You're an example and a role model for, for so much. Yeah. I can see why I'm mentoring and why, why you were kind of pulled into recruiting. I don't recall that that was something you had your, your mind set on, but that's really become a major uh way that you contribute to the field. Is there anything else you would like to say, Sheila, before we need to wrap up? Well, I guess I will say to all of those who are listening to your podcast, which are wonderful, by the way, I, I had heard them long before I even knew that you might come calling oh. me at some point. Um, please help us out. 
in the media. I mean, even podcasting is media. But I'm speaking of the local media, you know, around the corner from where your homes may be. And uh, help us out by reaching out to us. I- I'm not begging you for money. If you have some that you can, you know, give to people, great. But really what will help us even more is knowing that we have you as a reader and as a supporter and that you won't be silent. You don't see something that we should be covering. Let us know. We we missed something when we've covered something. Let us know because I know from experience that's another reason that we have lost some of the readership and listenership and viewership that we have because in some newsrooms we ignored you when you did try and contact us. So I, my apologies for that happening. I know it did happen, but we have in most instances, especially locally, uh, people who are attuned so differently and care so much about the community that they're putting in their own money mm-hmm. to make certain that we can yeah. keep delivering information to you that you need. Yeah. Well, thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, Gail, do you want to have any th- last words before we close? I just appreciate the conversation you've brought us, Sheila. Very much. Thank you. Th- and thank you both for what you're doing. This is This is so cool that here we are, over 70. Somebody else wants to hear something we have to say. That's right. (laughs) Saying it out loud. Exactly. Exactly. And listeners, because of your loyalty, our numbers continue to grow. Still, we need your support. Visit womenover70.com. Join Aging Reimagined Circle. Make a donation. And let your voice be heard and help change the conversation about women aging. Good idea.